Hi, how are you? Sonju Baba, come on, Achen. Hello, I can hear you. Okay, good. So, this is a session where I want all the young students to line up the questions to ask Sanjeev. He's in the Prime Minister's Advisory Council. He's a young, I think, probably. The, are you the youngest member in the Advisory Council, Sanjeev? No, Shamika is now the youngest. I was the youngest. She joined ah, six so months ago. So he was the youngest. He's still, okay, he's still young. Okay. So uh, today's uh, topic is India's place in the global world and what are the challenges. So, so first, let's go global, Sanjeev. Give <laughs> us a snapshot of where you see India. I mean, beyond the rhetoric, give us some granular details as to why India is the flavor of the season beyond the infra spend, the capex and stuff. We can come to that later. But why is India the flavor of the season for global investors? Why are we getting into the, uh, we are into the JP Morgan index. We probably next month we'll get into the Bloomberg index, uh, the foreign inflows, FDI. What is the story? Give, give the students a picture of, how India is being looked at. Okay, I'll give you a very quick flavor, but I do want to talk about education because yours is an education. Um, this related... is education, Sanjeev. You are educating them. No, no, no. I, I think there is something interesting to be said about the specific area of education. Okay. So I'll come to that, but I'll answer your question very quickly. See, the, the point is India is now generating... Uh, Levels of growth which are significantly higher than those of virtually any other part of the world. Um, so we, this year, despite the fact that the world's uh, growth is uh, tottering, we are generating about 7% GDP growth. And in 18 months' time, we'll go past Germany. And another 18 months' time, we'll go past Japan to become the world's third largest economy in dollar terms. We already are the third largest economy in PPP terms. So we are already a reasonable player and a serious player and growing uh, reasonably fast. More importantly, we are doing this without macroeconomic stresses that very often come with these uh, kinds of high growth rates, especially when you are uh, outpacing the rest of the world. So we have done this without our banking system blowing up. In fact, our banking system is in rude health compared to where it was five years ago. Our inflation is not spiraling out. Uh, in fact, even during the spike of 21, 22, our inflation was actually below that of many advanced countries. Um, our foreign exchange reserves is comfortable at about $620 billion. Our current account deficit did not blow up despite the recent spike in oil prices, although that has also come off. So our current account is in fact more than comfortable now. And there is FDI coming in. So all the pieces that you would expect uh, are in place. High growth in relative and absolute terms without overheating of the economy. And all of this with no help from the rest of the world are, you know, our services exports are still growing, uh, but the, uh, you know, merchandise exports over the last year have barely grown. So we are generating all of this domestically. If we had a world that was growing uh, uh, like it was in say the first decade of this uh, century, then we would be easily and comfortably doing 8-9% GDP growth. In fact, if we do get another patch of good growth in the rest of the world, uh, the economic machine we have created will easily do 8% plus growth. Okay, so that so is why people are excited about it. So that's the, I mean, you know, whether the grow, globe world grows at 3 or 4 or 5 is not really under our control. I mean, we can, we can contribute what we can contribute. But let me just sort of go vocal on the local. Uh, so the guys in uh, the companies listed on the stock exchange have been grumbling about consumption at the lower end of the uh, segment, the entry segments. The youngsters here are being told that unemployment is an issue. When you look at the GDP figure, it, we are growing at 7.3%, but Private consumption is only at 4.4, 4.2. The argument that it is a CapEx-led growth and consumption will follow. How do you explain this to people in an election year where all of these pocketbook issues will be, will play out? 
see i am not in the business of explaining things to uh, or winning elections for me i will make this case irrespective of the year we are in mm -hmm. so the point is very simple we are now tipped over into in an investment led growth mm -hmm. cycle this is exactly the kind of supply side led growth we have been trying to do for years and this is the only kind of growth that sustains itself consumption led growth never sustains itself there is no example in history of any country rapidly industrializing itself over any length of time using consumption led growth the key dynamic of growth is always investment led and if you're lucky also export driven we don't have the export part of it right now but the investment part of it is triggering now if you are driving growth using investment then you need your savings to support it so you need your savings rate to actually go up so ironically if you have this kind of a growth dynamic do not expect consumption to keep up with it this is what china did in the last 30 years you want chinese style growth well you will get it with investment not consumption before that japan did it before that G germany and you know the reconstruction of europe happened in exactly the same way um and uh, the us of the first half of the 20th century did the same thing and the britain of the 19th century did the same thing so we are not doing anything unique so if you try to have consumption and investment at the same time all you will achieve is actually your current account deficit blowing up on you so when we say amrit kal and the next 25 years of growth the only way you will get it is with investment rates being driven with supply rates going up as with, with with this savings rate in the country also going up which is what will happen which is the reason why you need a clean banking system and we took such a lot of trouble cleaning up the banking system because essentially this dynamic of growth is about savings getting sucked up by the financial system reallocated out to infrastructure industry all other kinds of investment this is the dynamic of growth there is no other known way of generating long term growth and if we get lucky we also get exports at some point it doesn't does is not a driver right now so it's entirely consistent what i'm uh, what you're seeing and what i am telling you this is the model okay so i don't want to sort of push the argument of that we can have a balanced growth or there might be some consumption the idea the questions that are coming up on consumption are reasonably related to what is the level of income generation in the agri sector or in the local economy at the entry level of jobs and whether we are creating jobs but let me ask the reframe that question in a so, different so way come to jobs uh -huh. let me tell you about jobs uh -huh. i am not a believer in this idea of jobless growth there is no example in history where jobs have been created without there being prolonged period of growth okay and there is also no example in history of a sustained period of growth without jobs being created so how so, do we define prolonged period of growth 3 4 5 years of 3 4 years of growth maybe more of growth but at least 2 3 years we have just come out of covid for 2 years you just have to keep going at this the point is you have to sustain this and if you sustain it for 25 years that's what the whole amrit kal point is okay so the point is you generate growth and keep at it and there is a peculiar uh, argument you know kerala uh, model of growth or some bizarre arguments will be made about trying to avoid growth as a generator of jobs i have never understood it the kerala model of growth is about generating jobs in the gulf so okay, there is a large a kerala audience here who i will get, get to re respond here but le let's move on uh, so the when we say that we are well placed uh, minister hardeep puri was here earlier and other speakers who have spoken have spoken about the level of growth we are achieving where we will be at in 2030 uh, and stuff how do you sort of see the i mean we invest less than what we need to in education and we invest less than what we need to in health now beyond and above that there are three levels of disruption uh labor mobility is challenging in uh, anti immigration world uh technology acceleration now imf has come out with a report saying ai could sort of shift or retrench human interface in between 30 and 60% depending on the level of development in a economy 
So that many jobs may be created or fewer could be created. And then there is climate change. Okay, I'm not even getting into the climate story because it's a, it's a bigger unknown unknown. How do you think India is preparing? Now, you're part of the council. These questions must be coming up. How is India gearing up to be ready for the disruptions? Or how is it sort of gearing up to move uh, past the disruptions? So first of all, be very clear. Artificial intelligence may need to be regulated for a variety of reasons, but we need to embrace this. Like any other disruption, uh, technological disruption, it will, but it will also create lots of new jobs. What we need to do is to be fluid enough to be able for uh, uh, to get upskilled in all of these things. And by the way, the jobs that will be created are likely to be for the relatively educated. So, uh, so if if it, the jobs that will be destroyed and being created will basically in in the relatively educated group. It's not like uh, you know, the the uh, guy who is uh, doing uh, municipal services and sweeping the streets. No, is fair getting... enough. It's not going to retrench the physical jobs. That's that's yeah. fair enough. So the people who are getting retrenched are also people who are in the best possible position to retrain themselves, particularly given the fact that our demographics is young. So we need to embrace uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And as it happens to be, a lot of this artificial intelligence is getting developed in India. Not necessarily by Indian companies, Google and Facebook are doing it, but it's getting done in India. So in that sense, we are creating a fairly big artificial intelligence sort of capability in India. Now, in this context, I want to get to the point about education, okay. uh, which I, I will get to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. The fact of the matter is, the education field, particularly academics, love to talk about disruption everywhere else. But in fact, it is their sector that needs to be disrupted completely. Why is it that, and I'm here I'm talking specifically about higher education, school education is a different matter. And you know, for the purpose of, of this discussion, let's talk about tertiary education only. The point is, <clears throat> why in the age of YouTube, do we need rep repetitive class lectures? It's an already outdated idea. All you need is to give a lecture once by the best lecturer in that subject, put it on YouTube, and the whole world can listen to it. And then all the questions can be answered by chat GPT. You actually no longer need classrooms, certainly not for lecturing and not even for answering questions. So this is a very important thing because it can mean that university education is actually can be completely revolutionized. We need universities maybe for doing research. You need them maybe for doing testing and certification. You do not need them for teaching, at least not subjects. You don't need practical things. I understand medicine may be something or, you know, uh, or you're trying to teach a pilot. You probably do need to get them to do live things, but there are large numbers of subjects where you do not need classrooms in the way you used to or need very little of it, which means that we can actually do a massive expansion of our tertiary education system um, into a totally different scale. And in fact, I would argue you can actually make it completely free for a large number of subjects. And as I said, not true for a few areas like medicine, where you still need hand... Uh, 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 on hand, uh, hands on uh, uh, experience. So, back, once again, so while you were saying your piece, I was trying to look for, look, see whether the chairman of UGC was here a short while back, was here, so we could have brought him into the discussion. Uh, but expand on the first part that you said, that, which was interesting, is to have the best professors and teachers uh, sort of stage. How would you? do that? Well, just put them on YouTube, create a curriculum for every subject and find people who are good at doing this. In fact, that is already available. So this is, this is All, a sort, sort of expansion. It's a sort of expansion of the uh, Khan Academy idea, but uh, you know, no, it exists on YouTube. If you know where to look for it, 
if you go to universities they know where on where in the world it doesn't even have to be indian if there is some professor in harvard who teaches a subject well his lectures are online and all the kids in the world are watching it no no i i get that like the sandal lectures on law and all we know that what what i'm saying how will you situate this in because what you're saying is an interesting thought you get the best teachers to teach in schools it could be available any time you could do away with a lot of the brick and mortar structures you could sort of have a way of certifying those things i mean there will be limitations to it i don't know how you learn lab stuff and natural sciences i don't hmm. know i mean th those things are those yeah. things are doable even labs by the way once you get rid of all these lectures you can hire a lab i know i can be i can hire time on iit lab on on on, on friday morning from 8 to 10 o'clock to do my experiments and go or okay I, so i mean why do you need to spend four years in the campus so you said that this could be a substitute and not a supplementary idea yeah it's a substitute that's what i'm arguing this idea that you need to go to university for four years and hang around uh for what you can do on youtube is ridiculous because all the all the students by the way the only reason they are attending class is because they have to do attendance ask any of them who want to attend they don't and you said that this could be the end output of this could be a certification exam or just a certification no you have an exam or testing system of some sort if mm -hmm. i pass how i do it is my problem after all that is how it used to be till very recently this you just and you don't have to come to campus you don't even have to visit anything if i can pass the test online from anywhere on the planet you give me a certificate i just need to prove that i understand what is being done that's all what you are teaching me right if i can prove to you that i have understood it and i can pass the test that you are anyway going to use to test me today also you do it why do i have to attend classes now once you get rid of this classes business out of the window it radically makes education cheap you don't need hostels you don't need getting you know uh, large numbers of uh, lecturers lecture halls all of this can be gotten rid of and the same iit campus delhi university campus whatever it is can pump through you know multiples of the numbers of students because essentially you can ask them for maybe once a year to come in for three months to create the sense of a class or whatever and for those things that cannot be sort of done online and you do them that they can come and do a few projects get to know each other network whatever it is they want to do but you can do it you know each batch comes in for three years three months every year that means suddenly instead of one batch you have four batches using the same campus okay so this is interesting i'm i'm like interested in this because maybe 20 years back at once when the school teacher absence problems and the school teachers missing teachers problem was there in all the primary schools in the districts i had said that why not just record the damn classes with the best presidents award winning teachers and give the cds and all and then i discovered of course that a number of schools didn't have electricity and fewer of them had computers but this is now we have shifted 20 years forward so i have two questions for you have you spoken about this is this like an active play have you written about this and a more important question since you are a history buff is that was this how education was imparted any can you sort of give a live wire sort of example of that in this period this is how this happened yes ekalavya did it no he was watching it from a distance and he turned out to be as good as arjun so the point i'm making to you is that you can learn from a distance um there are many ways of doing it and the fact that it wasn't done in the past is anyway neither here nor there the most of the even the zoom call i'm doing was not done in the past so technology enables various things and we should be able to use them um by the way uh, this idea that you know somehow you need to come to class and uh, do well is a ridiculously a ridiculous idea No, it's a It, radical. No, no, no. Your idea no, no, is a radical wait, wait, wait. idea. It's good. It's nothing even radical. I'm myself the product of it. I survived through school by not paying attention to the teacher. I survived through Shriram College by barely paying, by not attending any class, and I survived through Oxford by yes, attending the. Uh, so, Dude, I don't. But again, 
So yes. I, I don't know if this is what we want to encourage the young students here to do by bunking class and all. No, but, but you know, the point is I passed the exams. I talked okay. many of them. But no, so fair enough. I'm telling you, fair all the, you ask any, you know, if you if Bill Gates can become the greatest technologist of our generation and dropping out, Zuckerberg dropped out of college and became a billionaire. So the point I'm making to you is we are unnecessarily forcing people to attend class in the in this technological age. Why? Okay. okay. So I'm I'm going to sort of uh give five minutes for questions. Uh Anybody with questions, please put up your hand. Yes, the blue shirt there. Uh, hi, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, myself, Sriheri from Shastra University. Uh, since you just uh, talk about distance educations, uh, even now we have uh, many... Uh, it's not so much popular, but still it is prevailing for uh, graduations and uh, post-graduations where people take it from distance. But when it comes to employment or any job, sitting in a job interview, uh, few recruiters prefer uh, students going to the colleges uh, than of uh, distances. So if a person who wants to skip the college and uh, learns everything from uh, mm -hmm. the place where he is through YouTube or various uh, online courses, Yet, uh, even though he has all those capacity and capabilities of a normal student, he may not have an equal job opportunity just because he haven't attended college. So uh, how would you answer this challenge? So this is where I want to actually need the intervention. This old style idea has to go out of the window. We need a culture change. And that is what I'm arguing for. If I have got the certification, however I got it is my problem. Right. The employer should, in fact, only care about this. And in fact, worldwide, this is changing. We need to change this in India. Go and ask Google. Go and ask, uh, uh, you know, Elon Musk. All of these people are already talking about the fact that they actually prefer having people who have not even been to university but are bright. So they are creating their own testing systems, by the way. Okay. So I want, I, I hope the one of the purposes of my appeal, coming to this conference is to try and get people to get out of this hang up about attending classes. <clears throat> In fact, class attendance wasn't even thought to be a particularly important thing till the 90s. I'm telling you, I'm myself the product of not attending classes. And I still taught my college. So you don't need to attend classes. Why are you forcing, if you are such a great lecturer, kids will come to your class. This is a form of license permit, Raj, that you force students to come to class. Okay, Sanjeev, we'll take two more. To. Sanjeev, we'll get take two more questions and then wrap on the session. I'm being asked to wrap. The lady in the black shalwar kameez and the lady will ask a student. Ma. Okay. Good evening, sir. This is Santa Lakshmi, uh, civil service aspirant as well as student of international studies. Ma my question is, uh, we are aiming for the 5 trillion economy and uh, many more things. And what about the inequality, sir? Uh, to quote that, uh, India's top 10% wealthy people have 60% wealth and bottom 50% population have 6% wealth. So is it the time that says survival of richest and... Uh, what, how can we address the inequality? What is the government's perspective? Thank you. So I don't think those statistics are wrong. Uh, I don't think those statistics are correct. But there is, of course, an issue of inequality that we do need to take care of. And the way in which this government particularly uh, looks at it is slightly different from how Western world looks at it. Our view, which is <clears throat> encapsulated in the concept of Anto there basically states that look, what we really care about is that the bottom of the pyramids quality of life should improve. This is, in other words, we care about absolute poverty first and foremost, not so much inequality in the, that sense, but absolute poverty. And if you see the way in which this government has gone out of its way to create ways in which transfers can be made to the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, you will see that we are very dedicated to this. So, for example, look at uh, DBT, Jam Trinity, the toilet building scheme, um, the uh, Prime Minister's Avas Yojana, uh, the uh, Ujala scheme. These are direct interventions to 
try and improve the quality of life at the bottom of the pyramid. Similarly, a huge amount of infrastructure is being built because it's not just about the pyramid as in a uh, social pyramid. There's also the geographical pyramid that the eastern half of the country, for example, is much poorer than the western half of the country. Why is that the case? Well, one of the reasons is that the infrastructure there was not good enough. And so look at the huge rollout of uh, physical infrastructure you're seeing. You're seeing that all over the country, but special emphasis, for example, in the Northeast. For the first time, the Northeast is getting serious infrastructure built. You just saw the building of a temple in Ayodhya, but it also came with an international airport, huge amounts of other infrastructure, hotels, all kinds of things. That's Eastern UP, one of the poorest parts of the country. Um, you had a similar uh, expansion in Varanasi, also in Eastern UP. Uh, so the point I'm making is both in terms of uh, social hierarchy of uh, uh, poverty, as well as geographical distribution of poverty, we take this issue of Antudeh very seriously and believe in direct interventions in trying to uh, uh, alleviate it. Yes. Uh... Good evening, sir. So I have a follow-up. I'm sorry. Introduce okay. yourself. Uh, my name is Lakshita. I'm from MOP of College. So my question is more of a follow-up to your opinion. So you stated that, you know, it's not important to attend classes. I mean, from where you get and you just pass. But the cause that you're talking about in relation to education is an income for teachers. It's uh, an income for those, you know, publishing books, printing books secondly if you pump out four batches instead of one in a year the unemployment rate will increase because the jobs are limited in relation to the uh, graduates coming out and thirdly then everyone would like to retire at the age of 40 because they've worked for 20 or 30 years already so what can be the counter to your to these cons that have been mentioned in your idea given so this is the classic example of the fallacy of composition there is no limits in the number of jobs in the world. It's just like saying that, you know, because of technological changes, jobs will go. Um, you know, the purpose of the, uh, uh, the teacher's profession is to provide skills to the next generation, not to create jobs for the teachers. Uh, similarly, those who are writing books like myself, write books, <clears throat> not, not uh, you know, in order to educate people or get them to read better books or give them knowledge. Uh, we are not doing it necessarily to make money. Uh, it's good to make money, but nothing wrong with that. But the fact of the matter is the real purpose of academia is to create skills. And once we have created skills, there will be an expansion in the labor, of the skilled labor, uh, labor market. There is no limits to a number of jobs. The problem is the limits of skills. There's a shortage of skills. There is no shortage of jobs out there. As we create more skilled uh, labor, we will be able to generate ever higher growth. I can't hear what, what is being said. I said, Somebody... I said, I'll wrap it, wrap the session here, but are you going to write about this idea? I have written about it. I have spoken about it in earlier, uh, uh, earlier uh, thing. Achha. I'm happy to write about it in your newspaper as well. Okay. I shall, in I shall inform Santwana if she's here, that this is like a controversial, interesting subject to sort of bring in. Okay. Thanks, Sanjay. It was a lovely session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.